A very good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here and being here in support of this family in their time of loss. And uh, I just want to acknowledge, you know, we come here and the general tendency these days is to, is to say we just want to celebrate the life. But uh, we do also need to acknowledge that there's a, there's a great loss here and that you are a family that is no stranger to this having been here just a few years ago in similar circumstances. Just know that we as a church family uh, make ourselves available to you and our hearts go out to you and you're in our prayers at this time. So, uh, as I say, a very big welcome. There are some folk overseas as well and all over the world watching on, uh, on Zoom and I really hope it's working because I don't even know how to really check that it's working, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think things are in order there. But uh, very good of you to join as well, wherever you are. Mm -hmm. So on behalf of the family, thank you. Thank you for being here. I want to uh, just start out by reading a few sentences or passages uh, from Scripture. All of them relate in some way to what the family is experiencing now and also to death. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Timothy writes, we brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out. The words of Job, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We read at perhaps the lowest point in the lives of the people of Israel during the time of Jeremiah. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Such a proclamation of hope and faith. And then finally, from John 3, 16, those very well-known words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. So let's pray. Almighty God, you love everything that you have made, and you judge us with infinite mercy and justice. We rejoice today in your promises of pardon, of joy, and of peace to all those who love you. In your mercy, turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life and the sorrow of parting into the joy of heaven through our Saviour Jesus Christ, who died, who rose again, and lives forevermore. Amen. Amen. We're going to, in a moment, stand and sing a beautiful song that all of you know. But before we do that, I'd like to read from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. And so let's stand and sing all things bright and beautiful. <clears throat> 
To have some tributes to Liz, I'm going to invite Jessica to come forward. Uh, if you would like. <laughs> so, Sam's <sounds> reciting. <sighs> right. Good morning, family and friends. For those of you who may not know me, <laughs> my name is Jessica, and I am the oldest of Mrs. Frank Chu. On behalf of the Horn family, thank you for being here today as we remember and celebrate the life of the most remarkable Elizabeth Horn. Liz, wife to Ellen and mother to Kari and Mother, Granny St. Francis to her five grandchildren, and Great Granny Africa, as she was known to her two great grandchildren, blessed us with her presence for 80 action packed years. Born on the 23rd of October in 1942 in Human her dad, the local GP, and her mom, his nurse. Elizabeth was the youngest sibling to Mom and Peggy. After a very happy childhood in Houston, Liz and her mother moved to Cape Town after the passing of her father. There she trained as a medical technologist, later working in the Department of Ophthalmology at the then Kota Skier Hospital. It was in Cape Town that she met my grandpa, Emily and they were married on the 25th of November, 1961. 
and blessed with two children, Carl and Warren. Liz and Emlyn shared many common interests and spent the next 59 years of marriage together, road running, playing field hockey and tennis, running marathons, traveling, birding, and keeping the local municipality on their toes. <laughs> While the kids were growing up in Cape Town, Liz spent many weekends at the sailing club, in between dabbling in modern and jazz dancing. Holidays were spent adventuring along the hiking trails of South Africa with her family, sporting her ever fashionable signature cat's eye spectacles. <laughs> in 19, 1985, my grandparents relocated to Rivoli in Johannesburg where they established their beautiful home surrounded by lush trees and a garden filled with flowers and birds. Liz's untamed adventurous spirit and unlimited energy found her completing multiple two oceans marathons in her 40s, a comrades marathon at 45 and the London marathon at 38 years old. In addition to becoming an honorary ranger at the Pillensburg Game Reserve, Granny became an active member at Freeman Bird Rehabilitation Center, where she nursed sick and injured birds and bats back to health for the years. She adopted an injured mouse bird, Jerry, and later on another named Pickle, who she would carry around in an apron if they weren't perched on her shoulder or trying to build nests in her hair while she was busy inside the house. Liz wholeheartedly embraced every new opportunity she was presented with. As she became an accomplished golfer and bridge player, a hobby she enjoyed well into her latter years. Throughout her life, Bradley had an insatiable thirst for knowledge and learning, which is evident in the enormous library of books that line the wall of her study. She also completed her second university degree, majoring in political science at the age of 50. Her passion for politics and current affairs meant there was hardly a time in her life where the television was not playing a news channel, usually accompanied by an open newspaper or three spread across the kitchen table. When Liz and Ellen moved to St. Francis in 2002, they became very involved in the St. Francis Bay community, building many special lifelong friendships. In addition to keeping up with her journey, we were okay for them Rich and Paul, Granny took a keen interest in lawn bowls that became a favorite on family holidays with the grandkids. Both Emlyn and Liz were the busiest retired couple, both becoming active volunteers at the Ivory Bath of Penguin Rescue, where all visits for the grandkids included trips to the lighthouse, supporting penguin release days, and sometimes even a trip to collect a strand of penguin on the beach. If you were lucky, Granny would prick your finger and let you look at your blood under her microscope <laughs> that she, she set up in her lab at home, surrounded by bottles of strange worms and organisms she had collected during her time, researching the declining African penguin population in the Eastern Cape. Her groundbreaking research on this topic was published in an academic journal, which led to the presenting a poster at the International Penguin Conference in Boston in 2010 and Bristol in 2013. The desire to explore the world through travel, both in and around South Africa, as well as internationally, led Emlyn and Liz on adventures around the UK, Europe, Alaska, Canada, and most amazingly, in their late 60s, to Antarctica. Each of us here today have a different experience of who Liz was. But one thing that is certain is she has left an indelible mark somewhere in our lives. Her diverse love of the arts, the cricket, rugby, recently Formula One, animal rescue, scientific research and wildlife conservation, travel, politics, wine, and good GMT made her easy to talk to and a great success. Growing up, weekends at Granny's house were spent canoeing up and down the canals fishing at Granny's pool, taking walks into the reserve, and playing board games in the evening. Life at number 15 Cockle Street was never dealt to say the loose of the leaf. <laughs> One holiday I'll never forget was when I took an ice cream out of the freezer 
only to find a rather frozen scorpion inside. <laughs> Granny said she wanted to dispose of it humanely, and I never opened another ice cream tub and I'm never to open them. It's the right one ever again. Liz loved and was beloved by a school, a remarkable woman of character and determination to the very end. Her legacy lives on in our hearts and in the menagerie of birds, koi fish, and porcupines who are never late for their dinner in her back garden, as well as in her furry children, Becky and Pretzel. The last anecdote I'll share with you today is the memory I have of being in the Ravonia house as a young child. Granny had dozens of flower pots. Outside the kitchen door, always filled with the most beautiful and colorful busy business, which I can now say was a perfect metaphor for the person she was. Always beautiful, busy busy. And while the time has come for this one to really rest, the good she has done and the change and beauty she has brought to the world just by being who she was and living life to the absolute fullest will continue as we remember and see her around us every day. Really beautiful tribute. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Sean to come forward now. A friend who is going to say a few words. Good morning, everybody. Mm -hmm. I first met Liz in 2015 when we moved to St. Francis Bay. Uh, it was on the golf course. We've got two. Golden Retrievers, one is called Jeffrey, Jeffrey Bay, and the other one's called Carter, which I won't tell you why we call this Carter. Um, we used to walk on the golf course and there were a huge number of people and there were also up to 22 dogs on any one occasion when we all walked around there. But we used to all walk anti-clockwise and Liz and Evelyn used to walk clockwise. So, Halfway through our walk, we bump into Liz and him, and we'd stand and we'd start talking about politics and adventures and all sorts of things like that. And all the dogs were busy with checking all the females to see who'd been here and who, who'd gone past and all the rest of it. And that's how we got to know Liz. Um, these groups of dog walkers eventually started to distill into smaller groups. And we formed the Fabulous Five. It was myself, my lovely wife, Andrea, Carmen, Marlene, and Liz. And we used to get together on occasions, either to go and look at porcupines and have a couple of GMTs and maybe a glass of red wine and have a lovely evening. We all had to stop doing whatever we were doing, go and check out the porcupines because that's what we all enjoyed. Too. So that's how we started to get involved with Liz. She was a great adventurer, as you all know from what Jessica said in the photographs up on the, on the board there. And she turned all of her dreams into memories, which is fantastic. And I'm sure that's something that we all, we, we all um, want to do at some stage through our lives. Liz was also a great birder, as am I. And every now and again, she'd send me a recording on WhatsApp to say, what is this bird? And it would turn out to be a, a boo-boo or an olive bush right or a, or a terrestrial brown bull or whatever. And we'd get together afterwards and discuss the attributes of these various birds. I'd also get the odd photograph from her to say, what is this and what is that? So our, our common interests were also shared that way, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, the one anecdote that I want to tell you about is Liz and her cycling. One day she decided she was going to go riding on her bike out towards Human Store. 
Unknown to her, though, there was a cycle race on at the time. <laughs> and she suddenly found she was contraflow to all these speedy cyclists going the other way. And uh, she, she was taken aback by that. But that was a one wonderful time that we had together. I don't have a lot to say. I honestly don't. But uh, the memories of Liz are fantastic. And I think this whole thing, bright and beautiful, that, that we went through earlier on. We're talking about flowers and birds and cold and Antarctica and all of the adventures that are shared in that in that hymn. And I think that's how we, we should all remember this as a fantastic adventure because she did everything and she's got so many memories. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words. I've chosen a reading today from right near the end of the Bible, which is uh, the, the book of Revelation. It's a, it's a part of the Bible a lot of people are scared of because uh, people have tried to over mystify it. But um, I'm reading from Revelation 21, verses 2 to 7. And this is uh, John. Uh, the Apostle John writing, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. <clears throat> In a moment I'll speak into that passage, and it is a passage really uh, of hope. Um, uh, it's just a wonderful set of imagery, imagery that is taken from the Old Testament right through to the very end of the Bible. Uh, but first, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important before sort of speaking about hope, is to acknowledge that we are not immune from the bleakness of bereavement, no matter what we believe whether you happen to be a, a firm, strong, faithful Christian or not, no one is immune from the bleakness of bereavement. However much we believe in a future full of hope, we still feel the loss in the here and now, uh, and especially for you as a family, and some of you out there in the world somewhere. So we do ourselves no favours when we try to set aside our grief and focus only on celebrating the life. We've gone into a, a, a kind of a cultural mindset, I believe, and I'm not speaking for this family, where we tend to focus all of our attention on the way and virtually nothing on the farewell, um, like the memorial service itself. It hasn't been the case here. We have to acknowledge that there is loss, that there is the pain of loss, uh, and that there is deep grief that will continue for some time. Death is not our friend, you see. And this is actually a biblical notion. It separates us from what we know. It separates us from those whom we love. 
And it's something that many of us fear and do our best to avoid, hopefully. You know, when C.S. Lewis, the great Christian author, wrote the book A Grief Observed, he was writing about uh, his wife, Joy Davidman, who they'd been married for four years and she passed away tragically from cancer. And he said this, he said, the death of a beloved is an amputation. And I'm sure those of you who have lost people close to you will, will know what that means. I wonder how many of you have felt this in your own bereavements. You haven't just lost someone you love, you've lost a part of yourself. <laughs> and excuse me, I do have this horrible tickle at the moment. I'm fighting it all the time. <laughs> Elsewhere, in a similar way, C.S. Lewis says, at present I'm learning to, go, to get it out on crutches. So he's spoken about the amputation, he says, but I'm learning to get about on crutches. Perhaps I shall presently be given a wooden leg, but I shall never be a biped again. I do beg your pardon. With those feelings in mind, I chose this reading from the book of Revelation. It's a book that some people think is weird and troubling because it's got all this magical imagery. Interestingly, I, my, my oldest daughter, especially, is very into fantasy stuff. With Harry Potter and his dragons, and she reads a lot of those things. She's actually busy writing, uh, um, trying to write at least her own little novel, a fantasy novel. And um, I'm not into that stuff, but it's the same kind of imagery that you get in the book of Revelation that makes us sort of think this is strange. But at heart, it is just a document, a letter written to struggling Christians, suffering Christians under religious persecution. And that persecution led to the deaths of many of their loved ones. Loads of people were martyred. And so in that respect, we can find some common ground with those early Christians, the receivers of the letter to the churches of the Revelation. This can help us really draw some comfort and hope as well, along similar lines to them. You see, Revelation sees a world torn apart by sin and evil, and a God who wants to desperately put it right. He will judge the wicked and make a new world free from injustice and sorrow for those who love him. You could describe God's project as like the renovation of a house. Our reading here promises, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It's interesting that this new, new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and, and is established right here. Everything, we are told, is made new. Now, both my daughters this time, they love watching a thing called Home Makeover. <laughs> That's a program where they take run-down, inadequate homes, and these are redone in a short space of time with a lot of noise, um, a lot of sort of American charming, uh, by professional people. And the difference then between the start home and the end home is actually phenomenal. Really quite astonishing what these people accomplish. And I think in this book of Revelation, God is actually promising something like that, a cosmic renovation project, including the heavens and the earth and a new order of community. That word community is important in which to live. The new Jerusalem, a new way of life, a new order of life, free of sin and pain. He's already done it really, in his son Jesus, in raising him from the dead on that first Easter morning. He promises renovation for our bodies after our deaths and a great resurrection of the dead. The hope that we share by faith in Christ Jesus is that an Easter day for us is on its way as well. And an Easter day for Liz 
has very recently arrived. As Jesus was raised from the dead, his body renewed and renovated by God, so too will we experience that. Death is not our friend, as I said. And we who are left here, we are left to reflect and to ponder and to pray and to make, uh, make sense of it all. But I want to turn to one of my favourite passages in times like this. And that is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Paul has in this passage listed a whole bunch of things uh, that people think would separate them from the love of God. Because drought and famine and the sword, warfare, all those things, we think just draws us away from God. But he writes this, No, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I hope that as you walk through this loss and this grief, which is very real, you'll be able to hang on to those words and on to the comfort that is offered to us, that there is something better, and that in fact our death might be our enemy, certainly not our friend. The very first thing on that list that Paul writes that cannot separate us from the love of God is the word death. And so, we offer Liz into his grace of mercy and into his protection today. And for each of us, pray for peace, pray that God would enter into that grief, allow him in, and allow him to minister to you. Amen. <coughs> Let us pray. Merciful Father, Lord of life, you've made us in your own image to reflect your truth and light. And we give thanks today for Liz, for the grace and mercy that she received from you, for all that was good in her abundant life, and for the memories that all here who knew her well will treasure today. You promised eternal life to those who believe. Remember for good, Lord, your servant Liz, as we remember her and give her back to you. Bring her and all her rest in Christ into the fullness of your kingdom, that new Jerusalem, where sins have been forgiven and where death is no more. Lord, your mighty power brings good and brings life out of death. And Lord, we pray that you would have mercy on this whole family as they mourn the loss of Liz. We pray that you would give them patient faith in times of darkness. And that you would strengthen them with the knowledge of your love. Lord, you're tender towards your children and your mercy is over all your works. <laughs> Heal the memories of hurt and failure. Heal any regrets there may be in this room today. Help us to see from your perspective and give us the wisdom and grace to use the time that is left to us here on earth in the right way to be good followers of you, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. 
And so we lift up these prayers to you in faith, for Christ's sake. Amen. I forget to have our next song, which is uh, Goodness of God. It's also in the insert uh, in your handout. Shall we stand for that? that we remain standing as we draw to the conclusion of this uh, ceremony. Um, before we, we get into that, just to say that there is tea downstairs. Please join the family for yeah. tea. Uh, um, if you look sort of where I'm pointing, the staircase to the downstairs is there. You just go down and, and join them. We're going to allow the family to leave first when I've finished with the final blessing. And then you'll be just welcome to follow up after that. Some words from scripture. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great goodness. As a father cares for his children, so does the Lord care for those who fear him. For he himself knows of what we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. Our days are like grass. We flourish like a flower of the field. When the wind goes over it, it is gone. 
and its place shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures forever on those who fear him and his righteousness on children's children. So Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. In your keeping are all who have departed in Christ. Today here we commit our dear sister Elizabeth into your most gracious mercy and protection in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and rose again for us. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. God bless. God. 